Welcome to the special broadcast on the parliamentary elections on DD India, the great Indian elections. 2024 is an extraordinary year for elections around the world. A huge swath of the globe will vote in national elections. What might these elections say about the strength or frailty of democracy? On the show today, we take a look at why does Northeast matter as India decides. The two landlocked northeastern states of Nagaland and Mizoram go to polls in the first phase on the 19th of April. The two states have many things in common. The passion for sports and discipline along with bamboo exports make them stand out and set an example for others to emulate. A quick sneak into why they matter in 2024. Nagaland, in northeast India, is a landlocked state with a hilly terrain. It is bound by the states of Arunachal Pradesh, Assam and Manipur. The state also shares a border with India's neighbour, Myanmar. The British and the Japanese troops during the Second World War. Once a part of Assam, Nagaland, which became a state in 1963, has 17 major tribes. The annual Hornbill Festival that showcases the state's varied cuisine and dances is a major tourism attraction. In the 2024 general elections, Nagaland, which has one seat in the lower house of the Indian parliament, is going to polls in a single phase on April 19. The state has 1.3 million voters, out of which over 0.6 million are men, 0.6 million are women, while three belong to the third gender. Nagaland is governed by the Nationalist Democratic Progressive Party, supported by an alliance that includes the Bharatiya Janata Party and the National People's Party. Other political parties in the fray are the Naga People's Front and the Indian National Congress. During the 2019 general elections, the lone Lok Sabha seat in Nagaland was backed by the NDPP. With the central government's decision to fence the entire India-Myanmar border, the 2024 polls will be closely monitored in the border state. Election Desk, DD India. Translating to the land of Mizos, the northeast Indian state of Mizoram borders India's neighbours Myanmar and Bangladesh. Formerly a part of the Assam state, Mizoram was carved out as a union territory in 1972. It became a state in 1987. Blessed with hilly terrain, the state, which has its capital at Aizol, spreads over an area of more than 21,000 square kilometers. Over 90% of Mizoram is covered by forest. Most of the state's population is tribal. At 91.8%, Mizoram boasts of a high literacy rate. In the 2024 general elections, Mizoram, which has one lower house seat, is going to polls on 19th April. Mizoram, which is India's second least populous state has over 0.8 million voters, out of which 0.4 million are men and 0.4 million are women. The state is currently being governed by the Zoram People's Movement. Other prominent parties in the fray are the Mizo National Front, Congress and the Bharatiya Janata Party. In the 2019 general elections, the lone Lok Sabha seat in the state was backed by the MNF. The 2023 assembly elections saw the ZPM come to power in the state for the first time. It now remains to be seen if the 2024 polls will spring up any surprises in Mizoram. Election Desk, DD India. Well, Northeast for the second straight night is our focus 
the northeastern region is the focus of the great indian elections why does the northeast matter especially in this 2024 battle you know it's an important there are close to 25 seats there first let's quickly take a look at the two states that are going to polls in a single phase this is the lok sabha results especially of nagaland nagaland you had the ndpp not opening its account in 2014 the Naga People's Front picking up that seat, 2019, you've got to change the NDPP, that's the National Democratic Progressive Party, with the support of the BJP picking up that seat in 2019. The voting percentage, if, the vote, if you look at the voting percentage, there is a drop in the voting percentage, but still very high as compared to the national average of 67 that was clocked in 2019. Shift to the assembly elections. The assembly elections, not much change. The BJP there retaining the 12 seats that it picked in 2018 as well as 2023. But you got to see how things have changed for the NDPP. From 17, it's jumped to 25. And the NDF losing ground from 26 to 2. A look at the voting pattern, especially when it comes to percentages. Clearly, once again, setting high standards. The northeastern part of India, almost all the states, you know, you'll see very high voting percentage in elections. A look at the candidates this time around in the election fray uh, from this state of uh, Nagaland. You've got the NDPP that's backed by the BJP there. You've got the Congress in the fray going solo and you've got another independent candidate there in the fray. But it's, a, it's an interesting election battle that you would see for Nagaland in 2024. Shifting focus to Mizoram. Mizoram, you had the INC, that's the Indian National Congress, backing that seat in 2014, losing ground, conceding it to the Mizo National Front in 2019. Can the Mizo National Front repeat that magic again? Voting percentage, on the national average, you see Mizoram not voting high in the Lok Sabha elections. But if you flip it with the assembly elections, you will see the percentage almost take, almost having, you will see a quantum jump when it comes to assembly elections. A quick look at the assembly results uh, from uh, Mizoram. BJP picking up one, doubling it in uh, 2023. The Congress losing ground. The MNF again losing ground. It was a ZPM. You know, that's, that's almost picked 27 seats. They're having the lion's share of the seat, especially in the ele assembly elections. Voting percentage, as we mentioned, you look at the Lok Sabha elections, you look at the assembly elections, there is a paradigm shift, almost a 15% jump when it comes to assembly elections in Mizoram. A look at the candidates there in the fray in, from Mizoram. You've got the ZPM, the BJP, the MNF, two regional forces that are, of, that are you know, parties and candidates to reckon with. The BJP in the election fray, you also got a Congress candidate here in the election fray. But an interesting battle that you could see in Nagaland and Mizoram. Two other states that we are focusing tonight. One, the two states go to polls in two phases. Phase one on 19th, phase two on 26th. The two other states are Manipur and Tripura. Let's take a look at why these states matter from the northeast. The Northeast Indian state of Tripura is among the country's smallest and least populated regions. The state which borders India's neighbour Bangladesh is spread over an area of 10,000 square kilometres. Once a princely state, Tripura attained statehood in 1972 with Agartala as its capital. The rock carvings in Unakoti are among the state's well-known historic sites. In the 2024 general elections, Tripura, which has two Lok Sabha or lower house seats in the Indian parliament, is going to polls in two phases on April 19th and 26th. The state has over 2.8 million voters, out of which 1.4 million are men, 1.4 million are women, while nearly 74 belong to the third gender. Tripura is currently being governed by the Bharatiya Janta Party-led National Democratic Alliance. The coalition also includes Tipra Mota Party. Other prominent parties in the fray are Communist Party of India Marxist and the Indian National Congress. In the 2019 general elections, the state's two Lok Sabha seats were backed by the BJP. The 2024 polls will not just be a contest between parties, 
but they will also put the state's newly formed alliances to test. Election Desk, DD India. Blessed with exotic locations, the northeast Indian state of Manipur can be geographically divided into two regions, the Imphal Valley and the surrounding hills. The state capital Imphal is located in the valley. Manipur also houses the world's only floating national park, Kebul Lamjao. Manipur's main ethnic groups are Metis, Kukis and Nagas. Once a princely state, current day Manipur shares a 400 km long border with India's neighbour, Myanmar. In early 2024, the central government announced that it will be erecting a fence along the entire 1,643 km India-Myanmar border. The state's economy is mainly driven by agriculture. In the 2024 general elections, Manipur, which has two lower house seats, is going to polls in two phases on April 19th and 26th. The state has over 2 million voters, out of which 0.9 million are men, over a million are women, while nearly 239 belong to the third gender. Manipur is presently being governed by the Bharatiya Janata Party-led National Democratic Alliance. Other prominent parties in the fray are the Congress and the Kuki People's Alliance. In the 2019 general elections, the BJP and the Naga People's Front bagged one seat each. Despite having two seats, the polls are being closely monitored in Manipur, which was marred by ethnic unrest, though violence has reduced considerably in the recent times. Election Desk, TD India Well, the interesting aspect about these two states, Tripura as well as Manipur, in two phases, there is just two seats in both the states. But one seat will go to polls in the first, the second in that second phase, that's 26th of April. A quick look at number crunching on how these states have performed. 19th and 26th, one seat each. You've got in Tripura, uh, you've got Tripura East and Tripura West, two seats uh, that are there in the reckoning in the Lok Sabha elections. This is how it's played out, CPIM uh, holding it. It was a fortress for the CPIM, that's the Communist Party of India, Marxist, holding it. It was their fortress in 2014. BJP's managed to breach that, both the seats in 2019 with the BJP there. The voting turn out there in, uh, as I mentioned, the cross the northeast, you will see high voting percentage, but 82% in 2019, the voting percentage. Assembly elections, BJP dropped three seats five years later from 2018, but the CPM and the CP, CPIM, they are managing to win 11, but losing ground, especially in 2018. And the CPM, one of the biggest losers with CPI back capturing those 11 seats that the CPM lost in 2018. Voting percentage, again high. But when you see the national as well as the assembly elections, you will see high voting, high voter turnout, especially in Tripura. Well, this is the alliance that we are talking about. The INDI, the opposition bloc, has the Congress fighting in Tripura West. You've got the CPIM, that's the Marxist left party fighting in Tripura East. Well, this is how the candidates are. If the two candidates, the three candidates there for Tripura East, you've got the BJP, you've got the CPIM. Remember, the two, the two seats are divided between the two coalitions there. This particular seat, Tripura East going to the CPIM, the Tripura West going to the Congress. Biplab Kumar Dev, uh, you know, former chief minister there, now fighting from Tripura West. You've got this particular seat, uh, the Tripura West seat coming to the Congress, while the other seat, the Tripura East going to the coalition partner. Manipur, this is an interesting state, again going to polls in two phases. A quick look at the numbers on how elections have panned across uh, in the last 10 years in Manipur. In 2014, taking a look at the numbers, in 2014, Bharatiya Janata Party opened its account. They managed to win that, they, man they failed to open their account in 2014, but 2019 managing to win that. Naga People's Front, another coalition partner for the BJP, they're winning another seat. So both the seats going to BJP. Voting turnout, as expected, very high in the Lok Sabha elections. Assembly elections, numbers on your screen. BJP almost, you know, from 21 jumping to 32. Uh, a look at the regional forces there. But the BJP, the big gainer, especially in uh, the state of uh, Manipur, 
and uh, voting percentage in the state clearly indicate once again high voter turnout. A look at the two seats there in Manipur and the candidates in the fray from the state of Manipur for the two seats. There is an alliance, the BJP with the NDF and both parties have shared one seat each amongst themselves while the opposition bloc, they too have a coalition going there and they have shared one one seat amongst themselves. This is the inner Manipur seat. You've got the Congress, the BJP and the RPI in the election fray. The other seat, that's the outer Manipur seat. You've got Congress, Independent and the NDF there in the fray. It's an interesting election battle if uh, one takes a look at how, uh, you know, these four states are going to the polls. We're going to get into number crunching and look at the big questions that we are seeking answers on the other side of the short break. Stay with us. We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds. We get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts. We demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I'm Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington, D.C. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. Well, let's now take, get into the questions, the questions that we are seeking answers for this evening. Starting first, our first question, has the Northeast seen better connectivity and border infrastructure? Question number two, how has the sharp decline in insurgency helped people in the Northeast region? Finally, regional issues, do they resonate more over national issues in the election season? Two guests joining us this evening. We've got Deepak Divan, senior journalist, joining us in the studios. We've got George Thakuria joining us uh, from the Northeast there this evening to take the deliberations forward. Let me first come to you, Deepak Divan. You know, has better connectivity, better infrastructure done that magic that the people of Northeast were expecting for the last 10 years? More than 10 years, but 40 years, people have been waiting for all this to happen. Mm -hmm. People of Arunachal, they had not seen the rail uh, train okay so they now enjoy they are enjoying the connectivity of rajdhani going to the old capital of arunachal pradesh nahalagon twice a week okay now it is uh, not only for them but the rest of india has also discovered northeast with the better connectivity now we have uh, flights touching the state capital directly from delhi direct okay. flights earlier one had to fly from guwahati mm -hmm. or uh, uh, Kolkata. Now, with two and a half hours, you are in uh, the capital of Nagaland. They, you, you reach uh, Dimapur. You meet. Uh, you, there are so many flights to Imphal, mm. and uh, same is Mizoram. You have a direct flight to Lempu Airport. Now we have a direct flight to Sikkim's Pakyong Airport. So all this is part and parcel of the development. Okay. And it has also connected the people, mm -hmm. the people from the rest of the country to the northeast mm -hmm. and vice versa. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thakur, yeah, you know, a sharp decline, especially when it comes to insurgency that's taken place in the region, is that, you know, brought about calm, especially in the northeast region? Uh, yes, uh, because when 2010, up to 10, there was a militant group around... 15, 16 million group used to make a dictate on every uh, 26 January 15 August not to celebrate India's independence because they believe that Northeast India is just separated from the country. But slowly it has declined. Now you are nowhere. Uh, in Assam is totally peaceful. Entire Northeast is peaceful except two, three, uh, a smaller kind of incident happened. So 
once the once the militancy goes out more investment come now you you cannot imagine how gs road in guwahati has changed otherwise it is a small town seat but in guwahati has expanded lot of people come investment come people started walking till the midnight hour okay so it it changed the perception and suddenly there is a big debate whether you are an assamese or indian now it has gone now we are all indian but working in assam or other uh, assamese nationalism was more stronger than indian nationalism that kind of ideology and that north east india come to india uh, after 1826 yandavu agreement all bogus uh, kind of uh, 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 debate has gone away hmm. people started thinking that uh, we are this part of the country because mahapurush simant hankar dev in 15th century okay. he talk about krishna he talk about bharat barkha so that way to up to bhupen hazarika so everybody now understand do we are indian uh, like any mainland indian we are so uh, truly okay. indian and every every person in north east india except few uh, small group or small uh, kind of people they think that uh, india is is occupying this land so okay okay uh, it Ms- changed the last 2 3 2 3 uh, decades and i believe uh, bjp will get benefit out of this uh, tranquility and peaceful atmosphere okay mr divan when one takes a look at especially you know the border infrastructure development that's taken place you know when it comes to the northeast there is this general saying that there are many subtext to the original text do you see that playing out this time or do you see you know it's one parallel line you know that exists especially between delhi and northeast and that is the big catch phrase or the big you know point of symbiosis that one would see well you know let's not forget north is northeast region is the gateway to southeast asia True. for the rest of the country act is policy act is policy and at the same time you no know, because of the internal disturbances in myanmar the trilateral highway is yet to take off hmm. like you know by road you can go to thailand the road is almost ready but because of the internal dis- disturbances in myanmar that has not taken place and we have not waited only on this route we have developed uh, from agartala to bangladesh we have access to bangladesh uh, ports f- via agartala Inlet. you know lot of bridges have been made now you will be surprised that very soon we will have the railway connection to agartala to uh, kolkata via yeah. bangladesh okay which will cut short the distance time and money okay the big plus that i would say it would bring more tourists there especially to the region and that's important especially when it comes to the northeast a quick word from you takuring you know do national issues you know somewhere get lost in an election battle over regional and local issues uh definitely there is some uh, regional issue as well because identity politics is very strong in northeast india but as deepak told about that we have now access to chitagong port in bangladesh at the same time india is working for a chitu port in in myanmar if it is happens uh, through the kaladan multi border project so india can or northeast india can look for uh, market in uh, myanmar as well as southeast asian countries and uh, once the militancy has gone once the nationalism has uh, come out people started thinking for a, for a prosperous north east india and uh, definitely we we want to comp- contest with the mainland indian people in every aspect lot of students from uh, guwahati or north east india goes to delhi kolkata pune and uh, they they now come back earlier they did not come back now they have come back and uh, so regional politics is very much here but at the same time it is a national election suppose in lok sabha election people are people are voting for a stable a stable regime in northeast in new delhi so that so you can we can leave because china is very near to us in fact china occupy tibet and they come to our uh, neighboring uh, country and they are making lot of statement regarding orunachal changing the name orunachal many places so in that sense we need more nationalism in northeast india in fact orunachali people have shown shown their patriotism okay. at the same time keeping keeping our own identity we are indian by large so that is now understood by almost everyone Okay we are Indian by large there are 25 seats in the northeast remember it's a crucial battle the war cry is uh, the number of seats that's been announced uh, it's going to be an interesting battle there especially how northeast would decide you know or what northeast would decide especially as india gets ready for the test 
at the ballot box. Well, we're going to leave it there. But, uh, you know, the Great Indian Election is your one-stop show on weekdays on all that matter in the Indian elections of 2024. What could be the state that could form a part of our deep dive on Monday night? The state of Madhya Pradesh, also known as the heart of India, is ready for a political battle. With 29 seats on stake across four phases, parties will leave no stone unturned to win the central part of India. Watch Why Madhya Pradesh Matters on the Great Indian Election at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT only on DD India. Well, we're living in a fast-paced digital age of phones and the internet. There are apps or websites to cater for all, to all our needs and surprisingly the election process too. The Election Commission of India has launched multiple applications and websites to ease the voter identification and registration process for people. These apps and sites serve as crucial tools for political mobilization as well as participation shaping the democratic landscape of India. Antra Sena has more. In an era where democracy thrives on inclusivity, India's Election Commission stands at the forefront, pioneering technical advancements to ensure every voice is heard in the nation's polls. To embrace diversity and enhance accessibility, the ECI has brought out several mobile apps for a more inclusive electoral process. The Know Your Candidate app is a mobile application to help citizens know about the criminal antecedents of candidates contesting elections. Next is the SeaVigil app that enables citizens to report violations of the model code of conduct during elections. This app also allows users to track the progress of their complaints. The Voter Helpline app. This app is a comprehensive app for Indian voters to search their name in the electoral roll submit forms for voter registration and modification, download their digital photo, voter slips, make complaints, find details about the contesting candidates and most importantly, see the real-time results of the elections. The ECI has launched the Saksham app, working towards easing voter identification and registration processes for people with disabilities. The Saksham app provides all the voter-related services to a person with a disability. It helps them verify their names in the electoral roll, enrolling them and getting their name, addresses, photographs corrected along with other things. The Election Commission of India has not spared any effort when it comes to including each and every voter in the electoral process. The ECI has tried to make the whole process transparent. Well, that's what I have for you today in Election Digest. Over to you. Well, thank you, Antra, for that quick update. Uh, it's time for me to thank both my guests in the studios, uh, Deepak Devan as well as uh, Noor. Thank you. Appreciate your joining you. us this evening. Well, that's all we have time for uh, in this edition of the Great Indian Elections. It's time for me and my entire team to say thank you from New Delhi. Thanks for watching. Do reach us on Facebook, Insta and also on X. Our uh, Twitter handle is at the rate DD India Live. Good night. Stay safe. Take care. We tackled the four questions.